We are going into the um, last part of this uh, after, uh, first half of the afternoon, which is actually a reporting from the brainstorming sessions. And uh, so I'm going to chair, and um, here we go. I, these are the slides that we have collected, uh, all the um, brainstorming sessions, like moderators. So I'm, gonna I'm going to invite them on, on, the, on the podium, because they're going to present each one their slides, and then there will be some summary slides. So, um, uh, and actually, maybe in this order will be, let me give Francois first, then Gunilla, and then um, David Bromwich, and then uh, Greg Smith, and um, after Greg, uh, Gita, and the last Claire, if you can come over uh, the podium uh, uh, now, please. <laughs> and uh, essentially, they, I don't know if you have noticed how the program was structured, but essentially we had uh, um, every afternoon, some parallel sessions that we were building up from the presentations in the morning. And uh, uh, there are all the sessions. And uh, for each one of these uh, sessions, there were two, two chairs. One of them was the moderator of that day brainstorming session. So we were building up with, on the discussions that was presented in, in, uh, in that day. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, having your feedback in this. So. Um, I'm gonna start just with, uh, well, Francois, you can start with the, what is the man of the system? I don't know how to move the slide, yeah. <laughs> so here we go, back to you. Thank you. Okay, so this, uh, this is how we proceeded. We uh, started from the 10 uh, YOP objectives that are appear in the booklet, I think. And we asked the participant to rate all these 10 YAP objectives uh, on a scale from one to 10, with one meaning uh, objectives that have not been met at all and 10 have been met fully. Um, so we have these nice uh, probability density functions for each of the, the answers. And there have been a couple of interesting features that have been, by the way, robust across many, uh, well, the, the other brainstorming groups. Um, first thing is that um, the, the, the question that, well, the objective that got the, the best answer was uh, the additional observation uh, through dedicated field programs. But uh, if you notice, there is a, actually a, a bimodal distribution in the, in the answer. So it's a 7.3, but you have a, a, a bulk of the distribution in the 8, 9, and then a bulk of the distribution in the uh, 5 or 6. Uh, for reasons that we, we are not entirely clear why, so uh, it could be interesting to hear maybe opinions from, uh, from others. Um, then the second one scoring, scoring the best was the predictability of the atmosphere, um, cryosphere ocean system, which is also one of the pillars of the year of polar prediction. Um, nothing probably much to comment here. Um, the, the answer for which we had the, last, the, the largest spread was the, the verification, and for this we have, uh, we have two explanations. First explanation could be that uh, it's actually reflecting different communities, and it could be that very verification activities have been particularly successful for the atmosphere, for example, but less so for the ocean or less so for the sea ice. So that could be one reason. And the other reason is maybe more um, well, tricky is that we don't use the same verification metrics. Uh, we can broadly think that there are three sub-communities of people uh, verifying uh, predictions. Uh, if you come from the, fork, the operational forecasting community, you like uh, skill scores, correlations, root mean square errors, uh, abstract numbers. If you come from the model development, you like uh, fluxes, you like uh, temperatures, you, you like to evaluate physically your model. And then um, if you're a user, you don't care about skill scores or, or watts per square meter. You, you want to have forecasts that are exactly uh, verified at the location where you, where you live. So it could be also that there have been different levels of success depending on the, the community. Um, then the, slowest, the, the lowest score is uh, for the, the cost and benefits of using predictive information for users and services, but there we are wondering if it's just not a question of time and that uh, this is an activity that naturally takes a lot of time to, to build up and that um, in one or two years from now, we might um, uh, harvest the fruits of the, of the work. Um, 
Then the second task was about dedicated uh, objectives, namely the fifth, the sixth, and the eighth that you see on the screen. And for each of these uh, three objectives, we asked the, the people to, to reflect on what they would consider as essential activities to, to continue after uh, this consolidation phase of, of YOP. And we have uh, so three of those. The first one was uh, YOP site MIP. Uh, stressing the need to, to maintain uh, the existing um, collocated measurements, uh, also to try to converge to a common data portal and to uh, keep organizing uh, special observing periods in, in both hemispheres. Second one was uh, to continue the YOP verification activities with the, the difference I mentioned between process-oriented versus uh, uh, forecast-oriented uh, or uh, user-oriented verification. Uh, a strong demand for um, these um, model intercomparison and improvement uh, projects, uh, and also try to be aware of, uh, yeah, of emerging societal and stakeholder needs, uh, for example, related to what's going on at the moment uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the Arctic. Um, the last one is uh, Yop's Southern Hemisphere, and I would like to take the, the picture that uh, Dave presented, was it? yesterday or two days ago. So that's a, uh, as a re reminder, it's a figure showing the evolution of skill, uh, that's the vertical axis as a function of time for each year. Uh, and you have two curves per uh, lead time, one for the Arctic uh, at the bottom with the thick line and then uh, one for the Antarctic. So the Antarctic, if you look at one particular year, is always less skillful as the Arctic. But another way to look at it is to uh, freeze the level of skill and to realize that actually uh, Antarctic is lagging in terms of skill the Arctic by six to, to eight years. And um, there was a strong um, a strong interest in, in, from, from the answers we got to really take advantage of the Northern Hemisphere momentum for the YOP activities to transfer them to YOP, uh, to the Southern Hemisphere to try to reduce that window of six to eight years to, uh, uh, if we can, to zero. So, yeah, that was it uh, from my side, I think. Uh, So thank you. So the next uh, brainstorming session we're going to report on was the one that, that Johnny Day and I led. And we na narrowed it down to talk about uh, brain processes and um, future MIPs or MIIPs that uh, Francois also talked about here. So we started by having a Mentimeter questions to see if we are doing the right things. And I think we would, uh, the answer we got, I think, is confirming uh, that. The, uh, the group that we had in the room really liked job site MIP. There's a very high score there. And further analysis of the uh, models based on mosaic did not get as high, but I think that was a result of that we had this discussion before we had the mosaic session. Um, we also find that the Lagrangian analysis, which is a little bit different than uh, also using mosaic, but in doing it a little bit different than we are used to, that was also a fairly high score, uh, lots of really high numbers there. And uh, also the similar one for, for cold air outbreaks. So that's something definitely that we're gonna try to continue on. Uh, so we, uh, the, the scores was the lowest for the ones that are in the climate, uh, using climate models and nudging them. And I think that's reflecting who is in the room here. We don't have so many climate modelers here. And I think it's a really great way to maybe entrain and get some of the funding that they have maybe to, to do things together because it's the same processes. So maybe we should still pursue that line even though the scores were a little bit lower here. So some suggested activities and we try to report them here as we have the uh, next year to, uh, to really work on this as we have an extension after the end of, of the Polar Prediction Project. So we are in the, in the lines of publishing and uh, disseminating all the data that we have collected and written in this MODF and MMDF uh, f format. So we have that data set to publish, the papers that goes along with it, and the tools that goes along with it. So that's the really aim to have all of that published and nicely packaged for, uh, during the next year. 
We also would like to expand the and have a, uh, the website MIP concept to more sites, more variables, and uh, definitely start to have a, a really clear uh, conversation on how we can train stations in the Antarctic. We identified the need of having a workshop to identify next uh, MIIP activities and processes and specifically, and we have also, uh, and using the really nice data sets that we have now that we can use for this, uh, these activities. And I think it's really key to, for these to be successful because if to improve a model, that's really something that you do back home on your own work, but we can do things as a community to help each other find the right kind of diagnostics to find where and when and how we should try to improve our models. And that's what we're trying to do in this coordinated activities. So there is a number of different things there, and I don't know if I should take the time to read them, to read them out now. It's like more into this specific fields done. So we really want to have annual, my, annual workshops that we can share results and continue to co-develop the, the goals and the, uh, that are really both serving the goals that serves both the observation and, and the modelers. And continue to expand the Opsite MIP concept. Maybe move to near real-time MODF, so that could be more of a continuous activity built into the infrastructure of uh, uh, MET services and um, model developers. As I said, using the Lagrangian perspective. And, uh, and then we have some really research questions when it comes to the uh, representativeness of the observations and how we should best compare and develop uh, methods of technology to diagnose compensating errors, which we know that we have in the models, but we don't know when and how they really act and how we can come uh, against them or compensate for them or get them away, I guess. Uh, and then make use of tendency or other more complex data that we haven't really utilized so much. And then Southern Hemisphere, I think, will introduce some more complex processes as we know that they have more complex terrain and catabatic winds and so on. So I think that's all from my side. So next would be Dave. Okay, so we've actually heard quite a bit about the um, Southern Hemisphere already, uh, components of what the other groups have talked about. Um, so I think we took a, a broader view here, um, thinking about the transition to this next uh, proposed, what is being called polar coupled analysis and prediction. Um, so we thought that uh, we need a better inventory of what is, uh, has been um, completed. So both taking a short-term view and um, longer-term views. Um, we've, in green there, there's uh, an outline of some ideas about future research priorities. So as we move into the coupled analysis and prediction phase. This is very early days in the Southern Ocean, actually. Um, a lot of the physical processes. Uh, I heard a lot of uh, presentations on the stable boundary layer. If you want to stop and think, the biggest stable boundary layer on planet Earth is actually Antarctica. Uh, when the sun goes down, you have roughly six months. You have an area which is bigger than the continental uh, US and Mexico combined. And there are a whole spectrum of processes which are basically unknown at the present time, you know, like it, wave structures over vast distances, for example. We know very little about those. Um, mixed phase clouds, they're everywhere in the Southern Ocean. Um, and another thing that is sort of being mentioned here, but uh, is land surface models about the various polar surfaces, like on the tundra, the permafrost, the ice sheets, and actually how the sea ice is represented, whether it's a sea ice thermodynamic sea ice model or a coupled dynamic sea ice model with snow sitting on the top. Uh, an area where we could, I think, have some major short-term advantages 
um, advances would be radiance assimilation. Uh, a lot of the radiances over polar surfaces are not used at the present time. Uh, and I know the people in Norway are making some advances, but uh, that's an area of um, probably good short-term short development. Um, as far as the transition goes, I think we need to step back and reflect on the uniqueness of the polar environments. So things take longer to develop here. I mean, you can add up how long it's, you think it's going to take to do something in the Antarctic, and then you start multiplying, and you multiply by some factor which is, I don't know, it's not 10, but it might be 5. So that means that, you know, things take longer to evolve, especially if we have any ideas of fieldwork components here. Um, so I think we actually should be pushing not five years, but 10 years uh, for the next phase of this. Um, we do need, you know, the next generation of leadership to be identified. That's a critical area um, that needs resolution. Um, we talked about uh, MODFs and the model into comparison and improvement projects. Um, we do need to make sure there's a lot of work going on in the Arctic, I think, that the, and there's a lot of commonalities between the two regions, so, uh, ex, you know, active exchange of expertise and um, lessons learned, if we can figure out a smart way to do that would be very valuable. Certainly from north to south, but I'm sure we can learn, we can, we learn some things that will be valuable in the north. Funding. Uh, you know, uh, when in the evolution of atmospheric science over the years, I think things like NWP short term uh, have gotten less attention as time has going on. Um, climate, broadly written, is all the rage. I'll tell you a little story. I was chair of a search committee. We were looking for somebody in, like, numerical weather prediction, short-term weather. We got 110 applicants, and a two, maybe, were actually in what we were looking for, and we got all the others were in some aspect of climate. Now, this project is basically about redeveloping the capabilities in short-term you know, uh, more like weather, less like climate. I know there's supposed to be a continuum, but there's different concerns. Uh, so I think we need more effort to develop the community. That means the young scientists shifting the priorities somewhat of the fund funding agencies as well. Um, we definitely, and there's an, an applied science component here, which maybe is less directly applicable in climate. Um, we do need, you know, CIRA. We need to engage much more actively with the users. IARTO, for example, the tour operators. And, okay, I think that's pretty much it, okay? So, PPP, I think is a very good umbrella to continue, actually, in my view. And uh, so, thank you. Great. So I think now we're skipping back to Monday, if everybody remembers Monday, it was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so Ian and I, we'd, we'd organize it a little bit similarly to the, the other breakout, um, where we'd had the, sort of the 10 questions, for those of you who were there, uh, remember that, um, with sort of similar results, so I, I won't repeat that, and go into sort of the second part, uh, where we had these, these sort of three key questions that we went through and kind of skipped around a little bit. Um, 
uh, trying to trying to capture really you know you know the accomplishments of YOP gaps and and uh, you know what what's going on in the community. So the first one was was one of the most pr promising developments insights from YOP that should feed into future activities. Um, and and already on the first day, I mean it was it was almost overwhelming. We put this out there on Mentimeter and the boxes started popping up. Right, that there are so many great uh, promising developments. That, that people are aware of, and I don't know. I don't know for the other people, but I know myself. I've learned so much this week about all the different activities that have gone on and are going on. That you know, I think we would we would double or triple um, those boxes. But I already to go through a few of the, the key ones. So um, I apologize for those of people who don't see their box there. But we, we tried. There were so many; it was hard to summarize. But uh, so some of them, a key one that we've we've heard already. Um, you know about the ICO. The role of the ICO is very critical in terms of pulling things together, science communication. Um, those sorts of elements. Uh, Yop data portal as well for being able to, again, communication and sharing the data. The mod F files on those lines as well. Uh, Yop site MIP um, is a key, uh, key area as well, as well as the, uh, the MEEP. Uh, CIRA, again, we've heard a lot about. And the summer schools and the panel discussion, I think that was nice um, hearing about the role of the, the summer schools. Um, a few other areas. Um, the, the link between the, the models and the observations, you know, as one that came up in a few different uh, a few different boxes, that having that link there is a really a key element. You know, I think that's that's something too that there's still there's still room to take that to the next level. But already getting going on that, having the operations and the models and the obs, the process all together in the same room at least starts to starts to get those those communication pathways open. And we we've seen already some some transfers there, and be very interesting to see how that that continues in the in the coming years. Um, all right, a coupled operational model. I think Johnny mentioned that earlier in the panel discussion as well, that that's something that we've seen, a kind of a real change in the community from having these separate models to now moving towards uh, coupled modeling. Um, that's something nice to see. Um, and, and sea ice modeling, that there's, I think here we had, uh, we had two full sessions, I think, parallel sessions on the, on the sea ice modeling. Um, and I know something early on in YOP that we started talking about that, oh, we should really include sea ice as well. Um, and so it was nice to see that that, that pulled together. Um, and also one of the challenges there at sea ice early on was that it was seen a little bit as, as having different communities. There was kind of a climate sea ice community and a bit of a, you know, operations uh, community. And you can see now they're all being pulled together. We saw that in Ed's talk and in other talks in some of the sessions. Um, what are the most promising emerging developments that haven't been addressed by YOP? So I think this was a, an interesting question as well, and, uh, and interesting to see that, that there, there are some of these other areas that, that we're sort of developing in parallel to YOP that you know, we should really be thinking about and taking into account maybe in the next step you know, as, we, uh, as we see in what direction things are going. So one was the link to the hydrological community. Um, so it was something that was, that was discussed early on uh, in PPP. Um, you know, there's some different fits in time scales. I mean, we saw from Paul's presentation this morning that, you know, having those, those, uh, those runoffs, uh, better estimates of uh, the river inputs into the Arctic can have inputs in the, like the mixed layer properties in, in the Arctic. So that can have impacts then on the sea ice forecasting. So it's the kind of thing that could be uh, better taken into account in future. Um, the service area in Antarctica, so we, we heard that from um, several areas. Um, also, also the linkages. Um, uh, with the, the pole in mid-latitudes. Um, some of the other areas were with respect to new observational techniques. Um, so for example, uh, automated uh, systems like sail drones. So especially in the kind of new Arctic with increasing areas of open water, um, that some different approaches can be, can be very useful. So that's something uh, to, to maybe think a little bit how to, to better account for that. Um, also in the satellite uh, data section. Um, that uh, there's been some developments there that could be taken into account. Another sort of big area that seems like it's developed a lot in recent years that, that hasn't really been pulled in is, is uh, wave effects. Um, so there's been a lot of development in, the, I think, the wave community is really, you know, matured a lot, and, and there's a lot of, you know, operational centers now with, you know, very sophisticated wave uh, prediction systems, deterministic ensemble, global, regional. Um, there's a lot of projects um, ongoing in terms of, you know, how to couple in the different processes, so wave effects on the ocean, uh, the interaction of waves penetrating into the ice, breaking it up, the impacts of that thermodynamically, dynamically. Um, the wave 
effects on the atmosphere and, and pulling it all together. So again, in the realm of uh, you know, an increasingly you know, ice-free Arctic, uh, this becomes important. Um, and I think just as, as much in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, obviously there's some very big waves in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, hemisphere and so that's, that's a, I think, a really key area of processes to, to examine as we go forward in terms of improving some of the boundary layer processes. Um, another area that sort of popped up was one of, of sea ice pressure forecasts. Um, so we heard this mentioned uh, last night in the panel from Pascal about uh, some of their effort, you know, moving through ships in the, in the Arctic and getting beset in the ice, that really getting down to that scale of looking at the pressure on the ships and, and how we can be doing more accurate forecasts um, of the pressure and how to evaluate that. Um, so that can be important. We also had a, a bit of a discussion about gaps. Um, so old and unresolved gaps, new gaps. Um, so the couple data simulation came up. I mean, it's, it's again one of these um, these big, long-standing challenges. Uh, there's definitely movement in terms of getting closer to a couple data simulation systems, but it, it stands, I think, as a significant challenge uh, going forward. Um, uh, case studies and extreme events was something that came up. So uh, Tanio just made the, the comment um, at the end of the panel about this. I mean, uh, we had a bit of discussion about that as well. I mean, I think this is really a, an important area to, to consider in terms of uh, a focus for some activities. Um, also, in terms of connecting with, with users and, and products, um, having some uncertainty estimation in the products um, as, a, as part of uh, the, the product suite. Uh, boundary layer processes, of course, um, you know, again, one of these long-standing uh, challenges and also connecting to the, in the previous comment about wave effects, um, you know, improving wave ice ocean interactions um, and not just uh, in real time, but also having this included in kind of reanalyses um, as well. Uh, cloud microphysics and mixed phase clouds, um, again, another one. Aerosols are, are an area that, you know, wasn't included that much uh, in, in Yacht, but we heard about that a little bit this morning, um, as well as the role of aerosols and their importance for the clouds, um, as well as some of the, the sea ice characteristics. Um, so again, it was, it was a little bit differently. There was, there was so many inputs from Mentimeter. That, I mean, I think it's a great application to try to capture a lot of these ideas, um, but uh, certainly very, uh, very impressive in terms of all of the, the promising developments going forward. So hopefully this will help to, to inform some of the, the next steps. Thank you. So um, on the second session on, on Tuesday, Bruno and I facilitated uh, a, a discussion where we were really interested in who are the critical users or sectors we're trying to provide services for. So we were asking the group, you know, who are you trying to reach with the work that you're doing? You can see a lot of responses there. The size of the response corresponds to how many people uh, input that response. But you'll also see that if it's not the exact wording, there's, there's other ones there that are very connected. So communities comes out as one of the really primary ones, but there's many other smaller versions. So focusing on Northern communities and indigenous communities, specifically Inuit communities. So, so that is wonderful to see from, from my perspective. Um, and also one that has come up a lot around, you know, that's a challenge to really tailoring services to meet those particular user needs. Um, other big ones there are shipping, which relates to tourism, it relates to transport, it relates to industry, which are some of the other highlights there. Uh, military, so military operations or, or defense operations show up prominently. Um, also research, so there's a focus on research where researchers are users, whether it's logistical operations in uh, the Arctic or Antarctic programs or, uh, or inputs to models or forecasts that everyone is doing research on. And the last big one there that doesn't come out large, but it's in many of the small ones, is about emergency response. So uh, to, for disaster management or risk management or search and rescue, uh, emergency response is a really important um, end user that people were trying to reach. 
So yes, similar to many other sessions, we had a lot of great feedback. We could not include all of the details here, so these are the highlights. Um, we started by asking what are the barriers people face in connecting with those intended users. So I'm not gonna go through all the barriers, but here is focusing on how do we address those barriers or those challenges. And what come, came up over and over was the need for adequate and sustained time, funding, training, and personnel. So related to all the bullets under here, it was about needing to dedicate enough time, having the financial resources, um, having appropriate training, and the capacity with the people to do it. So some of the highlights are focused on relationships, which we've heard a lot about over the week, maintaining and, and initially developing those relationships, engaging key users from the very beginning. It helps to understand the user needs. It helps to improve communication, so to make sure if we're using the same words, we're actually understanding it in the same way and not using it in, in different ways that contribute to misunderstandings. Um, a real need to expand infrastructure and networks, which includes considering structural changes in, in say, government operations. Um, attention to interfaces and visualizations can really help to connect with users and address user needs. Um, so, so we've also heard over and over the expanded potential for the role of social sciences and also community sector-led research. So ultimately that comes down to co-design. We started a discussion on what does co-production or co-design really mean. We didn't quite get through that in our session, but, but the key factor there was working together across disciplines uh, from and with the user community from the very beginning and then all the way through in an iterative way to address ultimately the needs that were expressed. So, um, I'm happy to see Barbara added at the end there, um, contributing that S to PCAPS. So polar coupled analysis and prediction. Last night we heard Nina say, what about the S, like year of, years of polar prediction. So the plural part is really important, which is wonderful, but here the S is also referring to services. So that is really great to see. Um, and yes, so that, that is one of the, the outcomes of our discussion. Thank you. Um, so our, our session yesterday, we focused our brainstorming questions on data collection and training around that. Um, so similar to the sessions on Monday, we had a, a sliding bar that people could, could kind of rank some of the, the big things. We had a couple of questions about data, a couple of questions about training around data, and then just training in general across your proj projects. And the real key things that came out is that YOP actually did help to obtain a largely satisfactory amount of data, and it's being used by many people. YOP could do a better job of raising awareness about available products and how to use them, and who, and who the end users are. Um, most people felt that YOP had done a good job of training early career scientists, um, and I'll second what Johnny and um, Vicky said earlier about you know, giving people leadership opportunities really being a really helpful way to go about it. Um, but most people felt that there hadn't really been a good attempt at training non-scientific stakeholders. So we also had um, a word cloud there where we asked what people thought future training priorities should be. Um, the main one that comes out there is the couple of data assimilation. But if you, I mean, you can't really see, I don't think you see too well all the words on there, but it's a lot of it is around data. So sort of hackathons, uh, making modifs. So a lot, of, a lot of about really explaining how to use the data that, and the products that are being um, created during your op. In terms of opportunities for expanded training, we separated the um, answers that came out here into ones for scientists and one for non-scientist stakeholders. Um, so something interesting that came out for scientists is that observers and modelers training each other about their tools, products, and limitations. Um, providing shared resources and code repositories. So that's, that's a really good method of getting people information on how to use everything. And available resources to continue strong ECR programs. And I'm going to repeat my little comment there about the fact that we do need funding to help get especially early career researchers from the global south. 
because you know, we, don't really, we don't have anybody from the Global South in the early career day right now. Um, so an international project going forward can actually provide the funding for that. You know, what if the next Thomas Young is hanging out in South Africa or, um, <laughs> or Argentina? In terms of non-scientist stakeholders, um, development of improved interfaces and tools for communication, um, co-learning events for users and providers, user-led product specification, develop mechanisms to better identify and understand user needs, um, yeah, the next one was really interesting. So there was quite a bit of discussion about, you know, there's already a lot of existing expertise and existing training resources. And so maybe using the existing, maybe paying for existing courses could be a good way to, to get some of that training out there. Um, traveling tutorials to support pro uh, product utility within the communities. So there's a feeling that you know, people need to go out to the communities to give them the information. And uh, similar to what Gita was talking about, you know, involving the end users in the program development. And then just coming back slightly to the observations, um, so we read a bit of a provocative statement about, you know, is there already enough data? Do we need to collect any more? Um, so we did have an interesting discussion about, well, there is a lot of data, so we need to make the most of the observations we already have to better understand what it is that we have. Um, and then it's really important that we try and work out where we need to take or what additional observations we need to take. Um, that's really important to do. Um, Similar to what Dave was saying, uh, we need long time and coordinated programs to plan big activities. So perhaps five years is not going to be sufficient. Um, coming back, coming out from those YOP site MIPS, there's a really big benefit of observing everything at the same time and place. Um, and also, we need to you know, harness the new technologies that are coming out. So moving towards more autonomous uh, observing networks and systems. Thank you. Good, so I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but I'm going to give you the summary, which is in these last two slides. I'm not going to read them all, but essentially this is the summary of the summary, because we have to come out with two pages recommendations for WWRP out of this. So these are a bit, the, the, what has been said in the beginning, the three activities that are going to bridge, that we suggest are going to bridge PPPP and PCAPs is the Southern Hemisphere, uh, YAPS and MIP uh, um, leading to the MIP, and um, process and user-oriented verification. So these are the three key activities that were identified. Um, we have listed uh, from the physical science point of view, what, not only well, but what were the successful uh, developments from YOP that should feed in pickup from the ICO to the um, SERA summer schools and so on. Um, and all the models development that have led actually to, to the, you know, from the transfer from, uh, from science to operations, uh, especially for the coupling of, of the models. So this is something that needs to be part of pickup too, we think. Uh, then there were some emerging um, uh, things that you know, have been started to be addressed during YOP, but haven't been fully addressed yet. So we want to bring this forward. I'm not going to read them all because <laughs> Greg did a good job with that. And what are the gaps? We found new gaps. There are still unresolved gaps, like the mixed phase clouds, for example. So these ones should still be part of pickup. So part of, part of the job has been done. Part of the job is, is in process, and uh, there are new things that came up. Um, in terms of um, observations, so we think the pickup is too short. Uh, uh, there is too short timeline to have a big project like Mosaic, unless maybe it's going to be extended in 10 years. In that case, we need to find a champion for that. But essentially what we want, uh, at this stage, we have a lot of data, so we need to explore, understand, and exploit what is available. And when we do that, then we'll understand if there is further need. Um, we want to leverage from the YOP OSC uh, results to improve our observation networks. There are some geographical gaps. We want to uh, benefit from the multivariate observatories. Maybe we could start also, you know, like uh, assimilate some of that stuff, you know, not only using it for, for uh, you know, for uh, process understanding. Um, and finally, we want to consider moving towards a more autonomous observing networks uh, system. So more on the um, social side. 
Uh, so connecting with the users and understanding their needs. So uh, there have been a lot of Yelp success. Uh, Sarah really did a great job in engaging in uh, the user communities and sectors and a lot of user needs now, I think they're much better understood. Not all of them, of course, it's work in progress, but definitely we have made progresses. So they have identified some uh, key um, end users which are shipping, tourism, local community with the UNA, with the, um, you know, important uh, aspects uh, given to the safety. So future priority um, that, you know, a group like Sarah could have in, uh, in uh, PCAPs is to maintain, first of all, these relationships. So we need absolutely a continuity. There needs to be like a transfer uh, in, in this uh, buffer year, this 2023 between one project and the other, a transfer to the new people or a continuity of the champions. We cannot cut the legs to the champions, otherwise they are done. Um, so, uh, and the training is reciprocal, so the, it's a two-way exchange between the users and the scientists. Uh, so we want to expand on the role of the social science um, and, co and uh, you know, which leads actually to a community sector lead research. Um, on the design of the research questions, we have to co-produce, uh, so we have co-design the research questions and, and uh, co-produce products and services. So it means that the scientists, the social scientists, and the coder sit down together with the users and you know, do the interface that the user needs. Um, improve communications. This came out in a lot of forms, like from misunderstanding languages to, to actually internet connections, uh, visual, visualization, and so on. Training. Training has been a very strong component of YOP. We really um, offer training opportunities to the new scientist generation, and I think this has been picked up. We have a strong future generation of polar scientists. I think we lack a bit more into the training for the users, right? They need to know, um, so I'm here, sorry. <laughs> they need to know what is available. A lot of them probably don't know what is available. They maybe reinvent the wheel. You know, they try to adapt stuff that maybe has been done better in other frameworks. So there needs to be more communication and training there that connects the met services and providers to the users. Um, only with that we can have a, like a user-led product specification, and all the, the improvements of interfaces that I spoke before. So actually, an interesting uh, point was to involve the end user in the WMO program development. I think WMO <laughs> is going to waste, you know, top to bottom, bottom to top. <laughs> the users are not there, I think. So that is a very interesting one. <laughs> so, and for scientists, so actually uh, it was stressed out that modelers and observationalists have met during YOP and I have realized that they don't know anything of the other side of it. Of, so, well, not anything, but there is actually definitely um, a lot of space for learning more and learning from each other's communities and, and improve things. So this is the summary of the summary. I'm sorry I took a little bit long. If you have feedback, don't hesitate to email us. At the moment it's a bit late maybe to use uh, the, the blog wall or, or the chat, but re outreaches if we have missed out something important because this is what we want to feed uh, to the WWRP for the future pickup. I think I've finished. Thank you. Uh, we can start at 3.30 or 3.45. I think 3.45 because it's a bit kind of, you know, I want to...